the author of this book that we've been using for the series that we're ending today called Practicing the Ordinary finishes with this thought. What if Christians were known as a countercultural community of the well-rested, people who embrace our limits with zest and even joy? Don't raise your hands, but how many of you are living a well-rested life? What if Christians were known as a countercultural community of the well-rested, people who embrace our limits with zest and even joy? We're finishing up our series on practicing the ordinary. <clears throat> this is the list of some of the things that we've talked about. Waking, making the bed, brushing our teeth, losing our keys, eating leftovers, fighting with your spouse and your friends, checking emails, sitting in traffic, calling a friend, drinking tea. And today we're talking about sleep, the original Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord God, speak. Do what only you can do. Transform our lives by the power of your word and your grace and your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, I had the privilege of spending a whole week up in the northern part of Michigan, north of Gaylord, Michigan. That's just south of Mackinac Island. And you know you're in North Michigan because all of a sudden the trees change. They get bigger and bolder and older. And the forest gets more foresty. It's thick. And you look back and you see deer with antler. <laughs> and they look at you like, what are you? Not like the skittish deer do when you see them in Springfield and or Springbrook Prairie, and they're looking at you going, oh my gosh, I forgot there's a street here. No, these are deer that have thousands of acres to run in, and this is the north woods of Michigan. And it was a privilege because I got to spend that time with 15 other members of my family. My kids, their spouses, my nine grandkids, my wife and I rented an Airbnb, one Airbnb for all 16 of us. There were a bunch of bedrooms, I don't remember how many, but there were enough and it was actually cool because we rented it last year at this same time, but a couple of my grandkids got COVID. We couldn't go, and the owner said, you know what, we're going to let you put your money in, and we'll save it same week next year. So we had a paid-for vacation that we were looking forward to all year, and that was really kind of cool. I highly recommend that. So all of us went up to northern Michigan, and we got to go to Mackinac Island. And it turned out we didn't know this, but it was the weekend of the Chicago to Mackinac race. So we got to go on Mackinac Island and see all the tall sailboats. If you've not seen that, those are like amazing boats. We got to see all the crews. We got to eat too much fudge and have too much ice cream. And we got to do river rafting. And we got to do kayaking and biking and running and all the things and play board games and just all that stuff. We got to get mad at each other a little bit, but still had to go to sleep in the same house. And we got to hear stories and catch up, and there were tears, there was laughter. It was wonderful. So on about the fourth day, on the Thursday morning, we had a big deck, and it looked out into the foresty forest. And I'm sitting out there, I don't know, it was about 7 o'clock in the morning, and I had my coffee, and all the rest of the adults were still sleeping because they... We had played board games till, yeah, way after midnight. But the kids had gone to bed, and kids, once they're asleep, now sometimes it takes a little while to get them to sleep, but once they're asleep, for the most part, oh man, they sleep. And so they wake up, and they're ready to go, and all my grandkids were outside, and they were playing. Some were biking, some were climbing trees, some were doing things in the forest, some were doing things down below the deck, some were throwing rocks, all the things. And all of a sudden, my grandson, Ethan, he's about eight years old, he said, hey, let's play burrito tag. And I thought, I'm 64. How did I miss burrito tag all my life? Like, what is burrito tag? All right, my grandchildren are going to teach me something. And I watch, and all nine of them start going crazy. Not that they weren't going crazy before that, but they did it in a little bit more crazy pattern. And they were climbing trees faster and riding bikes faster and yelling and screaming at each other faster. And after about 45 minutes of that, adults were still sleeping. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, I can't figure it out. How do you play burrito tag? So I said, hey, Ethan, 
Come here. No, Pa, I'm playing burrito tag. No, come here, Ethan. No, I don't want Come here, buddy, right now. 30 seconds. It's only going to take a second. Okay, Pa, what? I said, Ethan, how do you play burrito tag? And he starts to explain it. He goes, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> I have to sit down now. He was right. <laughs> the deeper underlying principle was, you're too adult. You've forgotten how to play. You've forgotten how to just be. You're a doer, Pa. You need to know what are the rules? What's the starting point? How do you win? How do I crush everyone else on the way to my win? How do I play this game for success? How can I do it productively, efficiently? What are the rules? So I sat there for another hour or two watching them play, and I still couldn't figure it out. So I thought, I'm just going to go down and start playing with them. And I did, and it turns out that's the rules of burrito tag. You make it up as you go along. And you yell at other people and go, no, let's do this. This tree is safe So No, you can't ride your bike that fast. No, you got to jump over this hill. And everybody else goes, no. And then some of them do it and some of them don't. And then someone else comes up with rules. And pretty soon burrito tag is just fun. And you're having a blast. And I was having a blast. And I realized that they woke up that way. No one had to say, now kids, try to have fun today. Now, children, play, would ya? It just happened. And part of the reason it just happened is because they went to bed the night before with the expectation that tomorrow would be playful and good and better than the day before. They woke up in the morning ready for play. They woke up in the morning well-rested. So it turns out that sleep is huge. Sleep is one of the original, maybe the original spiritual discipline. Let me read to you, though, what the author has to say about this. And I'd like to talk about this in four ways. What do we love? What are our limits? What's the liturgy that will help correct this? And how do we leave a legacy? Because today is the last day of this series, and next week we start another one on Sabbath. Let me read what the author says about this idea of sleep and sleep habits. Our sleep habits both reveal and shape our loves. A decent indicator of what we love is that for which we willingly give up sleep. You see, all of a sudden, something seemingly lighthearted just got real deep. What we love is that for which we willingly give up sleep. I love my kids, so I sacrifice sleep for them. Often, how many of you have ever done that? I nurse our baby or comfort our eldest after a nightmare. I love my husband and my close friends, so I stay up late to keep a good conversation going a bit longer. Or I rise early to pray or to take a friend to the airport. There are reasons to love something enough that will shortchange our sleep for a moment. But if you do that every day, you'll pay the price. Then she goes on. It's glorious. Because <laughs> what we're talking about is that. That's a natural pattern of the universe that God wired into it. And sleep has been wired into your body even if you fight it. Like some of my clients who say, I'll sleep when I die. And I'll say, good, because you're going to die sooner because you don't sleep. Tell me how that's going for you. <laughs> Let me continue. But my willingness to sacrifice sleep also reveals less noble loves. I stay up later than I should, drowsy collapsed on the couch, vaguely surfing the internet, watching cute puppy videos. Or I stay up trying to squeeze more activity into the day to pack it with as much productivity as possible. My disordered sleep reveals a disordered love, idols of entertainment or productivity. Oh, it just got deep, deep, deep. 
my willingness to sacrifice much needed rest, and my prioritizing amusement or work over the basic needs of my body and the people around me with whom I'm far more likely to be short-tempered after a night of little sleep reveal that these good things, because entertainment and work are good things, they're a gift of a good God, but now they've taken up a place of ascendancy in my life. In the nitty-gritty of my daily life, repentance for idolatry may look as pedestrian and boring as shutting off my email an hour earlier or resisting that alluring clickbait to go to bed. The truth is I'm far more likely to give up sleep for entertainment than I am for prayer. When I turn on Hulu late at night, I don't consciously think, I value this episode of Parks and Recreation more than my family prayer and my own body. But my habits reveal and shape what I love and what I value, whether I care to admit it or not. My habits speak louder than my words. Sleep habits also reveal and shape what we trust. We lie awake fretting about our job or our health or the people we love. The wee hours greet us with our problems and our inability to solve them. What we trust in, lying in our beds at the end of a long day, is where our hearts truly lie. And then the author turns to that source that we all need to turn to, which is Scripture. And she quotes from the psalmist, Psalm 127. I highly recommend all of you read this psalm today. Take you five minutes or less, maybe even before you go to bed tonight. The psalmist declares, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman or watchwoman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early, and it is in vain that you go late to your sleep, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. And that's another way of saying God has created you for sleep. God has made you and me for sleep. That is a powerful truth, friends. How many of you spend time right before you go to bed surfing that phone, your iPad, the internet, flipping through all those millions of things you could watch but can't find anything to watch on Hulu and Netflix and Prime Video and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, a half hour, an hour has gone by and you say, I should have gone to sleep an hour ago. Or... You click on the clickbait, and all of a sudden, the political turmoil has you all frazzled, and you try to go to sleep after that. So what we love is sometimes pointed to by these things that happen in our ordinary life. How do I wake up in the morning? How do I go to sleep? How do I check my email? Do I have boundaries on that email? Do I say 5 o'clock it's done, 6 o'clock it's done, 7 o'clock it's done? Or or I have a client that I was working with this week. His whole team said to him, hey, stop sending urgent email after 10 o'clock at night. So all of us, myself included, need to think about this. So after we think about what our habits and and our ordinary practices indicate about what we love... We need to think about our limits. We are limited. Sleep reminds us that you are not God. Sleep reminds me that I am not the Messiah. I cannot fix anything by myself. I cannot fix it all. I will not order it all. I cannot keep control of all of it, even though in the western suburbs we tell ourselves that we can control it. Everything should just be up and to the right. If we just get the right guy in office, if we just hire the right team, if we just have the right productivity system, if we just, 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 we will control our world. But we won't. And so we try to stretch out the day. Or we've tried and now we're weary and so we need a little humor or something to deflect from all the worries of the day when what we really need is that deep, architecture of deep sleep, REM sleep, deep sleep, light sleep, and then that fuzzy zone when you're just waking up but you're not quite all there yet and you're just laying there for that last moment of rest. We need sleep. We have limits. I learned 
again, the limits that I have as a human being by some of the flying that I do. I do a lot of flying now. Now that I'm retired, I do a lot of work that requires that I get on a plane. And fortunately for me, it's in the United States, so my plane flights don't tend to be more than two or three hours. I try to schedule those in a way so I get home in time and I can get a good night's sleep. And I leave in the day when I can still get a good night's sleep and I don't have to make it to the four o'clock in the morning. But a few years ago, when I was traveling overseas to visit my daughter and grandsons who lived in Papua New Guinea, many of you have heard me tell some of these stories, it was four flights. Four flights, 26 hours, wheels up in the air, not, in cloud, not including airport time. And so being the productive, efficient person that I am, coming from Western culture, I tried to pack those flights back to back. And all of a sudden, I'd get over to Papua New Guinea after the fourth flight, which would take you up into the Eastern Highlands, and I'd get off the plane, and I'd land, and my grandsons would go, Pa, what's up? And I'd be like, (laughs) and it would take me three days to recover. And so after a couple of trips like that, I learned, you know what? Some of these airports, like the Singapore airport, has these little mini hotels. You can go rent a room for two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours, ten hours. Who knew? And I would organize my flight so that the hotel was right next to the gate that I'd get off in, and I'd go right over, I'd have a little room booked, and it would be booked for six hours, I'd get, a, I'd get a shower, and I'd get a sleep, and by the time I got to Papua New Guinea, I was rested. Who knew? And then one time, flying back from New Guinea, I was flying on a direct flight from Singapore to Los Angeles, which is somewhere around a 15 to 16 hour flight. How many of you have ever been on a flight where you've seen the sunrise? It's amazing, isn't it? How many of you have been on a flight where you've seen the sunrise twice? (laughs) The same one. The same flight. And that threw off my circadian rhythms. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, the world is built from the universe out to the mitochondria at the basis of my cells with an architecture by a good God with a mind who said, you will sleep. You need it, I need it. If you still are not convinced, if you still think that you are Superman and you can crush it, you are Superwoman and you can care for everybody else and crush it without rest, you are wrong. You know how I know? Because Jesus Christ came in a body. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of the living God came and needed sleep. He needed food and rest. You read through the Gospels, and it will talk about times when he sweat, times when he was worried, times when he was tired, times when he had to get away from the press of the crowds, times when he would sit with his friends and hang out and eat a meal. The son of the living God, Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, he had all equality with God in his hand, but he did not use them to his own advantage, but instead became like one of us in every way, including circadian rhythms. Jesus Christ needs a good night's sleep. Those are our limits. When we push against that and try to think, oh, no, no, I can stretch those limits. Here's what's happened. In, in one 24-hour cycle where we get less than the sleep that we need and to the degree that we get even less sleep than we need, this goes up. One bad night's sleep. It becomes harder to concentrate and harder to focus. So your productivity emails the night before are now making all the work that you do for the next eight hours even less efficient. It becomes more difficult to problem solve because the cognitive synaptical controls are slower and shutting down because they're off. You have reduced short-term and long-term memory. Your immune system is affected. Your balance, literally your balance, is affected. You become more moody and irritable. Your appetite tends to go up and in the wrong direction. Anybody in here, don't raise your hands, ever fight with weight? Best thing you can do is get a good night's sleep like for a year in a row because it changes your patterns of appetite. Oh, here's one to just throw in. It also changes your sex drive. Okay, moving on. (laughs) Friends, that's the cost of one bad night's sleep. So we need to know our limits. God has wired us for a good night's sleep, a good night's rest. 
if I need to know what I love and sleep points me to those things, and then I need to know that I am limited and I am not God, then I need some way to address the pattern. I need a liturgy, and that's the point, the liturgy, the ordinary. Liturgy means that ritual, that repetition. What are the habits? And we all have dozens, hundreds of habits that we use in the day, the way we drive our car, the way we brush our teeth, all those habits that make it easier to get things done, that make it regular. And so what are your habits around sleep? And let me stop right here and just take a time out and say, if you've been listening to this for the last six or seven weeks and you haven't made any changes in your life, why? Like, I'm not doing this, well, I am doing it because it's kind of fun, but I'm pointing this at myself. So right now, take out your phone. Do something productive with it. Put a little note in a day this week when you're going to think about how you practice the ordinance. No, right now. Like right now. You want communion? Do it. Oh, whew. did I say that? Oh my gosh, the Lutheran gods are just... I'm kidding. Grace will come in a few minutes. But you need to... That's the whole point. What are you going to do to disrupt just one pattern? If you're going to look at all the things we've talked about, and there was one thing I could recommend to you, if you haven't figured it out, then focus on your sleep. What do you do before you go to bed? I have to admit, I'm going to not ask you to raise your hands. How many pastors are in this room who too often spend at least the last hour before they go to bed looking at this dumb screen? Best thing I can do for sleep is put this thing down, shut all that off, shut the TV off about an hour before, and start winding down. Have a conversation with my wife. Maybe read something that's not a screen which will send blue waves into my brain and mess with the alpha waves and mess with my circadian rhythms. Maybe read some stuff, clean some stuff up. Better yet for me, if I'm going to work out the next morning, and I didn't get a good night's sleep, and I didn't shut off my screen, and my sleep was impacted, and then I wake up the next morning and say, I was going to go ride my bike. I was going to go to the fitness center. Ah, but I didn't pack my bag last night, and I got to pack my bag, and I don't have time to make it to the class now. I'll do it tomorrow. So maybe as your evening routine, you prep for tomorrow. Pack your gym bag. Get stuff ready so that the friction in the morning is ready for you to take off. You do you. But the whole point of this book is that we need to practice, which is intentional. Sabbath, which we're going to learn over the next few weeks, is a verb. How are you doing the basic Sabbath, which is sleeping? Again, if you're not sure about where this is rooted in our theology, let me do this for you. In the very first book of the very first verse of the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep. The spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Question for you. How many of you are six o'clock risers? Some of you are going, slackers? You wait till six o'clock? How many of you are seven o'clock-ish, eight o'clock-ish? How many high school kids in here can sleep till 12? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's when you start your day, right? Not according to the first book of the Bible. And there was evening. And there was morning. The first day. And there was evening. And there was morning the second day. And it goes on like that through the whole week of creation. And on the seventh day, God says, stop working. It's good. No, it's very good. 
The Jewish day starts at night. The Sabbath starts at night, at sundown. Your day begins with how you sleep. The rest of it will follow on how well you entered the evening hours of sleep. It's written in the scripture. But I've grown up in a world for 64 years that has told me, up and at them, bright and early, start your day. I get it. But the scripture says I actually started it six, eight, ten hours the night before. Seven years ago, I had to go deal with some stuff because I recognized some mental health challenges around addictions, anxiety, and depression, and I went to Linden Oaks. And then I've been seeing a therapist every week since then to make sure that I don't bring my junk to you. And one of the things, the first things they asked me was, how do you sleep? And I said, oh, I'm all right. How often do you get eight hours of sleep? I'm like, eight hours? How often do you get seven hours of sleep? I'm like, seven hours? How about six how about five? Sometimes. Because there was a period of about a year or a year and a half was where I was crushing it at night with Tylenol PM and I was waking up in the morning with three or four or five shots of espresso to turn off the Tylenol PM so I could get out to my day and be productive. Turns out that's not a very good way to live. Not for one day, not for one month, not for one year. What's your liturgy of the night? The last thing I want to share with you is this. What you love, learning your limits, building a liturgy, a practice around that that gets you in the cadence of Jesus will ultimately lead to something that I think is very important and I think all of you do too as well and it is this. What kind of legacy will you leave? What kind of impact will you make? If I'm a poor sleeper for most of my life and I let all of that stuff that ends up happening to me because of poor sleep pour out on you and on my clients and on my family, then I'm leaving a limited legacy or maybe a broken legacy. And I don't want to be that guy. I want to stand before the God who created me with limits and say, Lord, I slept. I slept to your glory and have God, God agrees, so good. And have God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Friends, one of the most amazing days of my life was the day on January 30th when I retired. <laughs> Retirement's not in the Bible, it's all good. I plan to retire when I die. That is biblical. Continue serving in different ways, but continue serving in whatever way God can make you into your 80s and 90s, and that's what I plan to do. But I plan to crush my sleep until then. And I got this little zip drive with video clips from many of you. It's about two and a half hours of you guys telling me how wonderful I am. Tears. But I had to ask myself, okay, that happened after 15 years of being a pastor in this place, and I'm grateful that I get the opportunity to continue some of that in teaching for these months. But now I'm out in the marketplace, and I'm dealing with executives and people, hundreds of them, thousands of them. I want to make an impact. And I'm having to ask myself, for this season of my life, how do I bring the glory of God the love of Jesus, the power of the Spirit into a world that does not know that love and power and glory? How do I make an impact? And when I show up at a client meeting and I don't have good sleep and I don't have good cognitive awareness and I don't have emotional tolerance and I can't lean into the teams that I work with and I can't help them, if I can't speak into executive's life and say, dude, you were horrible in that meeting. How was your sleep last night? And have them say, you know what? My sleep's been really rough. Because it turns out when you sleep bad and you wake up the next morning and you've got to go into a meeting and you've got to solve a $20 million CapEx problem, <laughs> your cognitive cycles are needed. When you've got to go into a meeting the next day and solve a major HR issue because it's tough to hire good people and keep them, you better bring your best creativity, and that means playfulness. 
When you're trying to have a hard conversation with someone who needs you to lean in and be the leader that God has called you to be, and your cognitive emotive cycles are off because you think you can fudge on sleep, then you are not leaving the legacy that God has asked you and called you to leave. I want to leave a legacy. So I need to learn to pay attention to my loves. I do that through these ordinary things. Recognize my limits because Jesus did. Put together liturgies, patterns, plans that will actually help me do the thing that God has called me to do, which for many of us is just get a good night's sleep so that I can leave a legacy and one day hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you want that? Then friends, you need to practice the grace of God in the ordinary moments of life 